Welcome to Nature Therapy Online. Hello folks and welcome to Season 1, Episode 10 of Nature Therapy Online. So it's really lovely to be here and to get to episode 10, the 10th week that I've been doing this. And um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because I'm still kind of learning about where this is going to go and, and how the podcast is going to find its feet because I'm not sure it's quite found its feet yet. I feel like I'm still, you know experimenting with different ideas and and you know d different tones and bringing different parts of myself on different episodes depending on you know depending on the theme and what feels appropriate so um but it feels like a big adventure to me it, it feels really exciting to you know just to to sit up here on my own in my house and talk in front of this microphone usually with my pets interfering, which I'm sure they will at some point in this podcast. Um, you know, they do in most episodes. Um, and just to, you know, know that it, it, it it's reaching people and that, you know, people out there are listening. I know that everybody who makes a podcast says this exact same thing, but I think there's a reason that people say it, and that's because, you know, this, this very simple technology is, is 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 a really beautiful and mind-blowing thing sometimes you know um so yeah thank you for tuning in i really appreciate it um so this week um i wanted to talk a little bit about um myths and mythology in nature um and how we connect with nature uh through stories and myth but also um, you know, also how stories and myth might actually cloud our judgment of nature or our perspective is probably a better word than judgment, you know, how we actually see things, you know, how do the myths and stories that we were told as children affect what we see when we're, when we're out engaging with the outdoors? There's some geese flying by there. You might have heard them in the background. That's it's very sweet. Sometimes I'm I'm doing this. I did this in the last episode. I noticed um, there seems to be a lot of bird noise going on at the moment, um, and I should clarify that because with my accent, people think I'm talking about grizzly bears, but birds, you know, with wings that fly. Uh, so so there are no bears outside my house. Um, you know, I had a nice wood pigeon last week on the roof and. And ju just then, and, and over the following weeks, actually, um, we get a lot of geese, a lot of geese, sometimes hundreds, um, flying right past our house in the autumn. So that will be interesting to see if I can catch some geese sounds for you. Yeah, I would, was talking about myths and, you know, what's the chicken and the egg with, with nature stories? Do they, do the stories affect how we see nature or do the... The stories appear because they reflect what's genuinely there in nature. So I recently read a book called Botanical Folk Tales by a writer called Lisa Schneidau. And this was a really, um, really interesting book for me because there were a lot of stories told that I hadn't heard since I was a very very young child um at the moment I'm reading a lot of um Scottish mythology um you know I live here in Scotland and and I, I I'm just I'm a little bit obsessed with it I think it's it's fascinating and strange and it really captures the the landscape that I'm living in but I'm from the north of England um, in Liverpool originally and something that struck me when I read these stories was this this feeling about nature that I had it, that you know these memories that came back from being so small especially the fairy stories you know um, 
and the story is one is a sto- an old myth about an apple tree that grants wishes and it was so strange when i read this story because i couldn't remember or recall ever being told this story in my life and yet there was this deep knowing inside me that i'd experienced this story before this sense of an apple tree being somewhere that you would make a wish and yet i can't recall ever being uh, read this story or ever reading it as a child so this is this really fascinating thing with nature stories from your part of the world you know i was probably told this this english story you know when i was really young but i have forgotten um but it's you know really um i think a really fascinating thing for you to do to look into old either fairy tales or myths from your part of the world ones that you might never have read and to read through them and see how you feel and see if you get any any of those kinds of feelings that come up like this deja vu you know like I don't know this, but I know this. Or this story makes so much sense to me, even though I can't really explain why. So in my case, why it felt so relevant and so right that an apple tree would be something that you wished on or something that granted wishes. There shouldn't be any logic in it, and yet it made so much sense. And I'm not going to try to explain it any more than that, other than myths around nature do feel like that a lot of the time for us. You know, the the very Scottish myths and legends that I love, um, they touch me really deeply when I look at the landscape here. You know, there's a creation myth about a big, giant old woman called the Kaliak or Beera. And, you know, in old Scottish stories that go back probably thousands and thousands of years... She was this giant of the hills who ruled the season of winter and she created the mountains in Scotland by bashing the big rock that Scotland once was with a hammer and shaped it how she wanted. And when people would look at the snow on top of the hills in winter, there was a myth that that was actually her clothing, her cloak, that she'd laid out on top of the hills after washing it in the sea to make it clean, which in some ways is like, you know, really strange, um, even quite funny in some ways. But in other ways, you know, um, you know, I imagine that could have been quite frightening, you know, quite scary, you know, at some time to look up at the hills thousands of years ago and and you know they 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 will have been some people especially people who were younger who who believed that was her cloak up there you know but there is some truth in these myths in that they represent the forces of nature that are out there these incredibly powerful forces that do rule us no matter how much we think we rule them we we dominate over nature at our peril and that is something that we are learning very quickly and very and very much in a and in quite a, a terrifying way actually um and that's something that i think we will be touching on or uh, in some future ecotherapy podcasts um but for now i think you know there is something about old myths and legends how they can personify the power of nature and when we read about them it somehow reminds us of the you know of what's what's in control and ultimately out there you know those forces of nature however we define them and whether we think of them in a very scientific way or or as spiritual forces um they are ultimately more powerful than us sometimes the myths are more playful so as another example uh, there's the myth here in scotland of thomas the rhymer and he was a, a, a poet and a fortune teller who by all accounts actually lived in the scottish borders um, which is the uh, you know as the 
name of the place suggests the the border area between Scotland and England, or one of the border areas anyway. Um, and the myth was that this guy told such great poetry and he was someone who could be trusted because he was taken to the underground by the queen of the fairies who took him underground for seven years and she gave him almost a gift and a curse at the same time and that was that he couldn't tell a lie. So with him also having the gift of being able to foretell prophecies he was, you know, according to myth and legend, you know, really in demand because everything this guy said was true, according to myth, you know. But what I find the most interesting and the most um, the most fascinating, actually, is the the part about the fairy queen living underground, underneath the hills, you know. There are so many hills in this area of Scotland... And I think this, you know, the the way that these old stories and in most myths of the world, not just Scotland, but, you know, in, you know, Greek, Greek mythology, in religious mythology, uh, Indian mythology, Japanese mythology, everywhere, there will be beings who live underground. And usually they're quite scary. But these stories also point to the life that is under our feet, you know. It's one thing to say, oh, well, they're only stories, so, you know, why pay attention to them? That's not interesting. But it is because they remind us, you know, here where I live, there's the, you know, I walk around in the, you know, in the fields and I know that there are badgers and, and rabbits and stoats living beneath my feet. You might live in the city and there might be, you know, there might be rats in the sewers under your feet, you know, and that's really interesting how we demonize rats. And in the countryside, a lot of people demonize rabbits and badgers, you know, this, the, you know, often uh, the, the, this feeling of that the animals beneath us can't be trusted. Now, where does that come from? You know, I don't know. I'm just. I'm thinking as I talk, you know, but these, I think that's why I like to just sometimes um, ponder on nature and nature myths because there's often connections. You know, the, you know, the, I mean, there's so many myths of the world. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to like, you know, go, go through them all or we could be here for a very long time. Um, but, you know, I, again, you know, in the Indian myths of, you know, the, the old epics of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, the role of the forest in those epics is, is so key and really reflects. I wonder if it really reflects, you know, how perhaps old Indian cultures felt about the forest, you know, as a, you know, as a place of, of, of danger, but also a place where you could really find truth, um, you know, and have spiritual insights. That's certainly true for me in, in woodlands and forests. That's where I feel like I, I'm, you know, constantly having, you know, powerful, powerful insights into, into my life just by being out in nature. So that's my invitation for this week, you know, discover a new nature myth related to your home country and have a little read of something new, something that you don't necessarily remember. See how it makes you feel. And just take it with you on a walk and ponder on how it reflects your perspective of your homeland. Ponder all of these things. Now, in the following podcasts, I'm hoping to be doing some interviews with some really interesting ecotherapists and nature therapists from across the globe. So tune in. Um, they should be really insightful discussions that we're going to be having. So I'm hoping to be talking with Andy McGinney, who wrote the nature therapy book called With Nature in Mind, which was a really big uh, inspiration to me in becoming an ecotherapist. Um, Stephanie Whitelaw, who is an art therapist and a nature therapist also, 
who's done some incredible projects over in Japan and also here in Scotland. And also Alistair Taylor, um, who put together the Prana, P-R-A-R-N, sorry, P-R-A-N-A, the Prana Approach to Ecotherapy, um, which is actually the very first training course I ever did was with this guy and he's so inspiring and he's such a lovely person I really can't wait to chat with him so lots of interesting interviews coming up lots of interesting discussions um as I said before I want to hear from you too so please let me know how you connect with nature and I promise to share your tip on the podcast as long as it's nothing filthy and it's set for everybody's ears. I'm really interested. So um, you can email me at Stephen with a PH at nature therapy online dot net with your tips for connecting with nature. Um, please, if you like the podcast, please give it a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. Um, you know, it really helps people to find this podcast and it really gives me, you know, it, it gives me some encouragement to to do it, you know, um, to know that people are, are, are listening and getting something out of it. It would be really, really appreciated and helpful. And if you want to bond with nature through an ecotherapy support course, remember that you can go to my courses at naturecourses.info. And you can join my courses whenever you like and get my support to help you bond with nature more deeply for your well-being. And that's me for this week. That was episode 10. And I will see you next week, my friends. Bye bye. Visit me online at naturetherapyonline.net